Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Music Lab Podcast. My name is Dog, and I'm so excited to be back with all of you for another episode of the podcast. Today, that gentleman to my left, Elijah Johnson. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. It's great to it's... great to be here in the morning. Yes. Happy, happy uh Wednesday morning to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, our social media pages. That helps us. That helps the bands that we feature and artists like Elijah. Also, check out our sponsor, RAR Outfitters. That's R A W R Outfitters.com. Don't just wear raw so elijah you were at south by i go to south by every year let's start with your experience at south by this year you played there last year you know what does that that festival mean to you what does the city mean to you and then maybe like some comparisons and contrast from you know from year to year sure um it was definitely a lot more fun this year going because i had the full band um, the, the, the year before I played one time and I played by myself and that was kind of, it was great and it needed to happen, but it was kind of like, felt like traveling a long way to just sort of hang out. Um, so honestly, the first time I went, it was much more like I was a spectator. Um, this time we were participating a whole lot more and we had toured all the way out there. Um, and yeah, no, I, we definitely had a great time. I mean, the, the, it's just like, I always forget how overwhelming it is. And it's like 90% of what you want to see isn't even happening under the official banner of like the festival. And so it's like, especially the, this year, cause like a lot of people weren't participating in the official part of the festival. So it was like so many bands I wanted to see where it's just like, Oh, this sick band from the other side of the world is playing at two in the afternoon at a bar that's like the size of my apartment. Like it's it's just this bizarre, just this really weird um, arrangement. And I don't know. It's I like Austin a lot. It's it's so funny because I, I I've only ever been there for South by. Like I've only been there twice. Um, but it's a uh, I don't know. It's, it's definitely, obviously you're seeing the city at it's like probably least representative point if I had to guess, but, um, I don't know. I love, I love being there. I love food. I love good. I love, uh, we basically spent like a lot of our time in Austin, me and my bandmate, just like tracking down increasingly good Mexican food, just like getting more and more to the real stuff. It was very, it was, uh, that was like a big part of our journey <laughs> was just eating. Yeah. We, that's funny you say that. Cause I, I've never like, obviously I love Mexican food, but like when we've gone down to South by, I've not really searched it out because, you know, we have some pretty decent spots around us, but mm -hmm. we found a Mexican restaurant right on the other side of 35, like mm -hmm. East Austin side, like literally, like you could see the highway from there, man, we went there twice. Cause it was so good. Like just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. I, I feel you on the Mexican food down yeah. in Austin. <laughs> so how many shows did you play then this year um, with the full band? I think we played with the full band three times. Um, we played with a different arrangement of people all three times. Um, and then I played a solo set once and I was supposed to play another one and then I got sick. <laughs> so I did not do it, but um we, uh, yeah, we played, I remember we played like the Athens and Austin kind of nighttime thing. We did a, um, what was it called? We played out at a whiskey distillery and we played, it was still Austin, that's what it's called. Um, our label had a party for that. And then we played at um, a brewery on St. Patrick's Day. And one of our band members is... Um, he wasn't born in Ireland, but he's fully Irish. And so we all wore matching Irish uh, soccer uniforms on stage and like did this whole, it was like, and it started raining, but people were loving it. It was a, it was a funny, we're like out there covering Bruce Springsteen songs on St. Patrick's day and our Irish gear. And the people were 
the brewery crowd was loving it. I'll say that much. <laughs> so it's funny you mentioned that because we were at Meanwhile okay. later that day for cool. West Texas Exiles. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, that brewery was fantastic. Like the beer was fantastic, like yeah. great venue. Yeah. Yeah. Great, so you were lucky brewery. to play there. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we were, we have a friend, Ellie, that lives out there who, shout out Ellie, she hosted us for, she hosted me and my bass player Aiden for I think five days in Austin. Um, and we were just kind of like, do you need us to do anything? She's like, no, it's okay. But um, she helped us set up that show at, at meanwhile. And it was, it was a great way. It was a great like ending of the, of the trip. So you said you had toured, you toured like, I think what, five or six States before the South by. Yeah. We had like a week through a couple days in Louisiana, um, Birmingham, a few days in like other places in Texas, like Houston and San Antonio and stuff like that. Okay. So let's talk about, well, let's go back. So you grew up in Snellville, Georgia, outside of Atlanta population. What are we talking? I don't even like maybe 40,000, 50,000 people. Okay. Um, and you went to public school or private school? I was, I went to public school half the time, uh, the second half of my school, but the other, the first half I was actually, I was homeschooled, the secret third option. Yeah. Wow. Not a lot of people, not a lot of people know that. So you're getting, you're getting a scoop. So yeah. Talk about that experience and like how that kind of shaped you as a musician. I definitely think like, I think that there's so much when people hear that there's so many like alarm bells that go off. Cause I think so many people that get homeschooled, it, it's like for some sort of avoidant purpose or it's sort of like, well, we're hiding from the world or whatever. Um, and also like you find out that kids that do it, like often don't really learn a lot. Um, thankfully my mom was, trained to be a teacher. And so we, we definitely did like learn things, but we definitely also had a lot of time to be kind of, I, I don't think I appreciated it until later, but we had a lot of time to be bored. Like I just had a lot of time. I got very comfortable being by myself and finding ways to fill time. And I think, I mean, when I look back at, I'll find things that I'm, I was like making when I was eight years old and I was like drawing, I mean, every kid's like this, but it's like, I was drawing com like comic books and I would like write a be like, this is my movie script. And it like would make no sense, you know? Um, so I think I just, I definitely feel like it created a lot of, uh, a, a vacuum for like, you know, having time to be bored, which can, uh, which usually creates, space for creativity is when you're is when you're feeling kind of bored and you don't have anything to occupy your mind um so yeah i don't know i, th I definitely think like it uh it gave me a lot of space to kind of let my mind wander which is which is something i've come to appreciate as i've gotten older so are you more of a lyrics first or a music first when you're writing songs i always i always tell people that it feel the best songs I write are when they happen at the same time. Um, I'm almost like a phrase first kind of person, like a, a, a melody and like a couple lines of lyrics will happen all sort of at the same time. Um, and if I can, if that happens, that's usually when the song is going to work out the best. Um, I don't, I'm not a, I'm not too like, if it doesn't come quickly, I'm usually going to like, let it go. Um, and there are times where I'll write something and feel really good about it. And it's just not finished yet. And I do need to give myself space or occasionally I have to bring in other people to help me write it. Um, but usually ideally it's like a phrase. It's like a melodic and a lyrical phrase all at once, like a hook first kind of mindset and so you started playing when you were 18 i started yeah i started recording 
music, I guess, when I was probably 16 or 17, just like in okay. my bedroom. Yeah. Um, I've been, you know, I'm a, I was playing guitar when I was like 12 or 13 or something. Um, and then about, yeah, about 18 or 19, I, I, I booked, I think I was 19 when I booked my first show. Um, and that was the beginning of me playing live. So that was, yeah, that was kind of when that all started. So most people at 19 are either going to college, they're playing video games, they're working. Not only are you playing live music, but you're going to one of the premier colleges in the entire country, sure, the sure. University of Georgia. Like, let's talk to the audience about that experience because, you know, we only hear, the general public only hears about the football team and like, you know, like their success. But like, what is it about that campus and university that's really special and what made you go there? Definitely felt, um, the reason I really, honestly, the reason I wanted to go there was because I knew that it was a place that had a lot big framework for, you can go to school here, do well in school and also be a musician. Cause that's like such a part of the history of that school. Um, and so that was part of what drew me there. Um, and I'm, and I'm really thankful, but I don't know the, the thing about Athens that's so funny is like, people that are there really and it is getting more, it is definitely getting more expensive but people often will talk about Athens like oh it's so expensive and like it's just so not like I living in Atlanta I'll go back for the weekend and be like wow this is this is unbelievable like what I'm paying for everything and um I think there's a weird sense of like it's the same thing as like boredom, like a place where stuff's just kind of cheap and you can, you have a little bit more time to just kind of hang out and you have a campus that's not super, I mean, I think it's, it's whatever you make of it. My college experience was not super nose to the grindstone. You have to be hitting the books a thousand hours a day. Um, I also never took a science class <laughs> and all my friends that did had a different experience, but um, I don't know. I definitely think there was just like a lot of time, a lot of like open space to walk around, you know I mean? Like I feel like that's a, an underrated thing. Just like the fact that everything that I wanted to see and most people I wanted to hang out with were either a, a walk away or, a couple minute drive growing up in the suburbs. It's just like, you can't walk anywhere and you have to drive far to do anything. So I don't know everything about Athens, like felt a little, especially towards the beginning of my time in college. It's just like you live in a, you live in a snow globe basically, you know? So I guess if you were like a realtor or like a, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Like, somebody for the visitors bureau for Athens. Mm -hmm. It's cheap. Um, what else would you say about it? Is that, well, it's, it's, it's becoming less that way, but it's, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's like, um, just a lot of creative people there and, and a lot of places that are, there's just like a, there's an infrastructure for art there, which is really helpful. Like a lot of places they don't have, um, they don't have art galleries. They don't have concert venues. They don't have, and that's not like a, a moral thing. It's just like, if you wanted to get a job working as like an art curator or working, booking a music venue or doing anything like that, um, you'd be hard pressed to, to, I don't know. It's just like being in Athens was, was a great place to do that kind of thing. Yeah. So talk about the music venues in Athens, one ones that stand out to you. I know the 40 watt is not there anymore, correct? Oh no, it, it still is. Um, oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's still there, still kicking, still great, still okay. fabulous, as they say on the website. Um the Georgia Theater, I, I mean, we've played there a bunch of times and I used to work there. Um, so oh, we uh I love I love that place. It's it's just such a you know, 
it's just it just sound it sounds the best it it feels great being in there every time it's just like you can't really beat it um recently there's been this interesting move where a lot of, there there was a venue that was very beloved for a long time in Athens called the Caledonia Lounge that closed um and it was where like it was kind of like everybody played their first show there was kind of the the move and um there's been all these, you know, several places have kind of taken up that um, mantle afterwards. But I, there's these two venues that are kind of small. One of them is called Flickr. It's this tiny little bar. Um, and another one that's it's actually a venue inside the movie theater. There's like an art house movie theater downtown that yeah. called Cine that has a, a separate room where you can do shows. And the amount of bands I've seen in both of those places where it's like, oh, I'm watching a band that's like on the precipice of something probably a lot bigger than this room. Um, I like a couple years ago, we saw that band Wednesday in Flickr and there's like 80 people in there and it was packed. And I remember just being like, this band is going to take over the world. Like this is an insane sounding band and they're so good. And it's just like, it's, it's so exciting that we have a space like that where, we have several spaces like that where, you know, you can see really cool bands like that in environments that are super welcoming and super receptive, you know? Mm -hmm. So you've now been in Atlanta for, you said what, almost a year? Yeah. Since like last August. Outside of cost, what, what is the main difference or what differences in Atlanta compared to Athens? I mean, I'm sure music venue wise, Atlanta has just as many or, or as good, correct? Yeah, I mean Atlanta definitely has a lot a lot going on. I think the thing about it is that it's obviously just you know magnitudes larger. And so Athens everything is super centralized. Um and Atlanta has just a hundred different centers of gravity as far as like where things are happening. Um cuz it's just such like a neighborhood based city like um and so i don't know yeah it's definitely i mean i moved here just kind of like for personal life reasons i needed to be uh closer to my to my girlfriend and 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 have really really enjoyed like i grew up in the suburbs and so i every time i would come to atlanta it had this air of like ooh, you know kind of i don't i don't do this all the time and Right. I knew very I knew very specific pockets of the city where I had friends, but I didn't know a lot about um, the whole the city as a whole. And so, even living here, sometimes I, I like drive somewhere new, and I'm like, "Ooh, this is kind of like I didn't know this was here," you know. Yeah. But yeah, because you're right. It is a it is a city of neighborhoods because you have Buckhead, you have Peachtree, right? Like where the There's Braves the Stadium is now. Like that's a whole. Yeah, yeah. The, well, the, the yeah they moved the Braves out to the suburbs, which was kind of sad. But stupid yeah. too. <laughs> and no, and no mass tra- like no public transit to like the stadium. No, like no. you have to drive there. It's so silly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And now when you drive down, I drive up that road a lot. And there's what's funny is that people like will park at a gas station and walk like half a mile across. Like, I mean, the 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 road that's it's like a state highway that's up there. It's like a six lane road, um, with medians and stuff. And people are like, and and the sidewalks are kind of suspect. Yeah. It's like watching families walk like a mile from the Taco Bell, you know, to the to the baseball stadiums. Like, there's got to be a better better solution than this, but. I digress. I'm not a city planner, so. Yeah, I hear you. So you mentioned the Georgia Theater. You played there just Valentine's Day, correct? Oh, yeah. Um, did you do a special set list because it was Valentine's Day, or did the theater do anything? We we didn't do – we dressed up. That okay. was a big thing. We, we all wore – like, I wore, like, a, a tie, you know, coat and a tie, and – um all this, well, actually it was a denim jacket. It was a denim coat and tie. Um, but I, um, we did, the big thing was that we learned us. We were initially 
I had big ideas about maybe learning a bunch of old songs and that didn't really happen. But um, we learned the song, the song called Valentine's Day, the Bruce Springsteen song okay. um, from the album Tunnel of Love. The, it's the last song on that record. And we learned that um, because my brother and one of my bandmates, Aiden, that went to South by with us, they love that song and really put me onto it. And I was like, this is amazing. And um, all that to say that we learned that and we liked it so much and we got so stoked on it that we were like, we should just keep playing this. This should just be part of the set list for a little while, just cause it's not, it's kind of a refreshing, like different type of song than what I normally play. Um, so yeah, we did that. I had my curated love song playlist that was the between, you know, set music and it was a great it was a great night. Yeah. There's nothing like live music on Valentine's Day night, you know, to end your night, you know, dinner and then a show like you we go wrong, kind right? of thought the same thing. The crowd maybe didn't. <laughs> the crowd the crowd was a little bit uh thinner than what we were hoping Expecting. it would be and it was kind of like Maybe we have learned our lesson to not do this on Valentine's Day anymore. Fun idea. Maybe next time we could do it the week of. Maybe not on the day of. Um, but it was, yeah, it was it was funny. It was fine. It's, yeah, I mean, you got to try, right? <laughs> it's all, so, all worth an effort. So you've you've mentioned Bruce Springsteen a couple times already. What, what does Bruce and what does some other artists that you can mention that really – kind of shaped you and and you know you're big fans of bruce, bruce for me is so funny because i'm not i'm not even like uh like a real bruce expert would be probably horrified by my lack of like in-depth knowledge and and sort of my lack of like understanding of his entire catalog but i think what my relationship specifically with bruce that's so interesting is like um my parents turned me on to a lot of music that I love. And, and I mean, there's plenty of music I love that didn't come from them, but they were very like, you know, you listen to whatever you want, as long as it's not too crazy. You know, they were very supportive of that. And, um, but the one thing they loved classic rock of all stripes, the one thing that neither of them really got down with was, was Springsteen. And I always thought that was kind of, and I, in my mind, I just didn't know why. And so growing up with them, I just like thought, oh, maybe Bruce isn't really that great. And, um, you know, my parents don't like him, so I don't know. And then I got, I remember listening, like actually engaging with it for the first time. And because it was something that I had been told my whole life wasn't very good, it almost felt like it felt very punk rock in this weird, like Bruce is obviously the like specific. I remember specifically like being 17 and listening to born in the USA, the whole album and like crying and being like, this is objectively the least punk rock thing maybe ever like mid eighties pop Bruce. But also there's like the rebellious streak in me that was told like, you know, he's no good. Don't listen to him. And that part of me is so like electrified by this, you know, by this music. Um, so I don't know. And it's just like his storytelling can just be so direct. And I think like it's just having those kind of lyrics and that kind of phrasing and that voice. It's just like it's really an un, an unbeatable combination um, in a lot of it's, ways. It's funny you say that because I I. I'm kind of like your parents and kind of like you. I I was never a big Bruce Springsteen fan. I appreciated what he did for music, but I just sure, yeah. couldn't really like, I don't know. There's just something about it that was just like, eh, you know, whatever. But then we saw him live at Jazz Fest. Oh my goodness. And it, it that cemented it for me. I was like, and during the entire concert, I'm like, I'm saying to myself like, okay, now I get it. Like, okay, now I get it. You know, like yeah. just amazing so like I, I i'm really glad that i was able to have that experience because if not i probably would still have that you know that attitude yeah. about him yeah, yeah. definitely but so what other artists then um i don't know when i was when i was a kid i or when i was 
in high school, I, I was very into, um, I was always, I got very stoked on that band, uh, Animal Collective when I was a, a young man. And I really, it's, I rarely listen to them these days, but it's cause it's so specifically tied to that era of my life. But it's funny. I just, I, I find myself thinking about songs and I like realize after the fact that I had sort of a, I mean, I don't make music that sounds like that at all, uh, honestly, but I find myself approaching things certain ways and being like, I think I learned that from an, from like an old animal collective song. Like, I think that that approach to their approach to songwriting was so, so different than anything I'd ever heard before. It's just so like sound based. Um, and so, not sit down with your guitar and write a riff and write a vocal. It was so different than that. Um, and I think that really helped kind of expand my mind a lot. I mean, um, I always tell people like there's a, um, there's a guy named Daniel Patton. He, his artist name is one of tricks point. Never. He makes ambient music. Mm -hmm. He did the score for like all the softy brothers movies and stuff like that. And he basically invented, you know, Vaporwave, the kind of like all sample based, kind of like almost like implanted nostalgia of like, oh, there's these memories of songs that aren't really real, you know, that just sounds like something I remember. Um, and I don't know, that, that kind of approach to texture and using sounds from the past in a kind of provoking way of like pushing you to re respond a certain way i just i don't i don't always know if it comes through but like philosophically a lot of that stuff is very important to me and how i think about music do you do you when you say that statement is there a song that you've written where you feel like you've gotten as close to, as possible to that the song there's a song on the end at the end of my most recent album it's called nobody ever feels this way and it was definitely like i remember we showed it to my to a couple of our friends and one of my friends was like it sounds like you're trying to write a song now for like the soundtrack of an 80s movie and i was like well it's certainly that like it's it's both sonically and also lyrically like trying to punt like hit the register of like a a John Hughes movie or a, or a, um, like a big booming 80s song. And it, it had all these heady ideas about like, you know, what it means to be a young person. I mean, the whole concept of like, nobody ever feels this way is how, obviously that's how you feel when you're a, a teenager is you're like, I'm the only person that's ever felt this sad, you know? Um, and then you realize obviously that you're not, um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I That was, I think, the closest I've come to really hitting that thing that I, I want to do sometimes of, of like pushing the, the button of like reminding someone of, of something like that. Yeah. So before you kind of became what you are now, you were in Well Kept and with your friend Tommy. How did that all come about and talk about your relationship with Tommy? Still, still am. Well, still, still an active concern. Yeah. Um, okay. Just a little, just a little bit of a, a pause since our most, since our last record a couple of years ago, but um, okay. definitely still, still active. But um, we, uh, I don't know. It was my, the, basically I met Tom very early on in college. And the, the way I always explain it is that when I met him, neither of us knew like we were, we met in a musical context we met literally playing in the church band um and we met that way and neither of us knew that the other person did music outside of that like i knew that he was a great guitar player but i didn't really know much beyond that um and then i remember i found out that he had a band and then later on he found out that i i recorded music but didn't, didn't really do, I didn't ever play. And I remember being so fascinated by him because I was like, Tom has a band that plays sh shows. They play parties. Like 
Tom gets paid money to play at frat houses. That's in that's in I just like so alien to me. It was like so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then he had the similar feeling, I think, when he found out that I made music where he was like, this weird guy with the big glasses from the church band makes music that sounds like Elliot Smith. You know, that's how he explained it to me where I, my early music was very like acoustic double track vocals and stuff like that. And he was like, what is this dude making lo-fi crazy music? And so I think there was, a, there's always been a little bit of like a, a, a helpful, like, chasing each other around of like i think that's what's great about any sort of artistic collaboration is like you always kind of want what the other person has a little bit and so it kind of goes in cycles where he'll be making music that's super far out and crazy and i'm in the mo and i'll get in the mode of like i want to write a country pop hit you know and he'll kind of be like no come on you know and it'll it'll be this kind of cycle like that um so how that relates with well kept is that we uh started him and a guy named hampton p that played drums on a lot of my music for a while we started playing my they were the first version of my band um when i was in athens and i and i stopped playing or i was playing solo all the time and they were like you need a band and i was like all right um and then we had a fourth guy join our friend Chase and they were like, we were my band. And then Tommy got asked to play a show, his other band, his old band that was called Jester. They were this great, like, uh, college rock band. And they were just very cool. A lot of, a lot of great shows. Um, but they got asked to play a show. They couldn't. But Tommy could, and he was like, and the person was like, well, do you just want to play your own music solo? And he was like, sure. And yeah. so he asked us, like, hey, since we're already playing Elijah's songs, could we learn six of my songs for a show and just play those? And we were like, yeah, sure. And so me and him switched. I was playing bass. And and it was originally the, we were billed as Tommy Troutline of Jester. Um and on a on a on a gig and and after about three or four shows he was like so i've been wanting to do my own solo thing but i want to call it well kept and we were like well that's a great very catchy band name so we start it just kind of was my band morphed into that and over time it, it, things changed a little bit and people moved and left and came back and joined and and thankfully we're all i mean literally every the other day like the past and current members of well kept like all went we all just like had we went kayaking together <laughs> it was just kind of like this is so funny that we're some of us are in this band some of us are not and and we're just like you know it's all cool so it's it's definitely turned into a nice like as much of it's as much of just a group of people that hang out and do things together as much as it is a band, which is, which is really nice. Cause not a lot, certain bands don't have that connection with each other. Yeah. That's kind of unheard of really. So that's, you're really fortunate to have that, you know, relationship with everybody. So yeah. does everybody yeah. live still in Athens then from well-kept or where's everybody live? Most actually of the five of us that are in it now, most of two of us are here in Atlanta, me and the drummer Blake. Our, our synth player, Hampton, lives up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then Tom and our lead guitar player, Ian, are still in Athens. So we're kind of all over. That's kind of, that's been the, you know, we just haven't had as much time all in the same place. Um, so we've just had a little bit of a a pause. And so that's why a lot of times when we, when we are all in the same room, it's us more so just hanging out just because it's like, you know, sometimes we'd rather do something like go kayaking than, you know. <laughs> <laughs> practice right. um so yeah i don't know okay so do you feel like it's getting more difficult then to balance like your solo project with then the band or or is because your relationship with them that makes it that easy then i think that i think that we're at a stage now where um 
my own music is definitely the priority. Um, and I would say, I mean, it's been that way most of the time, but um, it's definitely the priority right now. And, and Tom's such a prolific producer. And I mean, everybody in the band has their own, everybody in Well Kept has their own thing that they're involved in outside of it. Um, which is, which kind of keeps it so that we're not all like sitting around like bored or whatever. But, um, yeah, no, we, I, I, it's definitely not, it's definitely not hard to, to make it both work. I mean, it's, it's a lot of the same people involved. So it's, yeah. it's just a matter of what's on the schedule, you know, which songs we plan. Gotcha. So let's talk about your love for Vampire Weekend. The new album is fantastic. Um, okay what when did you get into them and like what was it a particular song was it a particular album you know what is it about them that really i was in that i oh i was in the eighth grade when modern vampires of the city came out and my middle school girlfriend had a cool older sister who with cool friends and they all put us on to Vampire Weekend. And then they actually took us to see them uh, on that tour. And I just, I mean, I lo- I was just kind of like, uh, I was so blown away by that album. And I loved the first two when I went back and checked them out. Um, but it was on, like, I, this is going to sound really ridiculous, but I'm, I've got this big Beatles poster right here that I'm just kind of looking at if my eyes wander. And it's, it was, it almost was like, it felt like hearing r- like rubber soul or revolver where you, you, you are like, Oh, this is a band that's awesome, but this is something so totally different in terms of like scale and maturity and I just was so blown away by that Modern Vampires album. Um, and I just, that show I think was like probably the, probably the most formative live music experience I, I had as a, as a kid, just being like 15 and seeing them put on like just an absolute monster show and just being like, this is the only band that exists. <laughs> like this is the band. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know. And then I wasn't I have not come fully around on their on the the return album, the fourth one. Never something about it just never really clicked for me. Um and but the the new one the new one feels like a real that was where I was like, "Oh, this feels like the record I've been waiting literally 10 years for." Um and that was a great, a great feeling to to feel that way about about a, a band like that again. Yeah, uh, that Capricorn song just washes over you. It's just, it's That's so cool. good. Yeah, <laughs> and I love. I'm so, I'm so interested in how much of the record is like break beats and loops and like drums that are and like rhythm in a way that's really hypnotic. Um, I think it really, it just, it really works well for me. I'm not, I know, and I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little wary. I mean, I'm going to see them on the tour and I'm sure it'll be amazing. There's a little bit of their whole stepping into like jam band aura that I'm a little bit wary of. Cause I just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a very reluctant jammer. Uh, I'm very, it's like, it's gotta be real good for me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, what, what is it that doesn't connect with you about jam music? I think it's just that, um, I don't know. It's just something about, I think it's just, I'm so song minded and that's not like a better approach. It's just a different approach. Um, it's certainly not a, a superior or a smarter way or anything like that. That would be very self important to think that, but I think it's more so that I'm like, 
I'm more interested in the story and the arc of the song. And I think other people are more interested in the story and the arc of the music and of the feeling of the show. Mm -hmm. And um, my brother is a real, he loves, like, he's very into the dead, but he's also very into, like, bands that are not jam bands, but have that kind of same mantra of kind yeah. of like the cult following, you know, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard type. Yeah. You just kind of have to be there. You have to be in it type bands. And um, I don't have anything against it necessarily. It's just like that kind of stuff really doesn't connect with me the same way I think it does other people. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. I, I was uh you're you're 24? 25, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm 47 or I'll be 47. I did not appreciate jam music until only about five, six years ago. Um yeah. so I, I I was with you. I, I never connected with it. I thought it was silly. Like, why is this song 30 minutes long? You know, like I don't need to hear the same guitar riff for, you know, like four minutes. But like I feel like once like the more music that I, that I listened to and, and how my perspective kind of changed as I got older, I think now I appreciate jam music. Like goose is fantastic fish. I mean, obviously fantastic. they are really goose is really, I mean, I, the thing is I've come to kind of like a begrudging respect almost where it's like, I can't knock the, we always joke that um, my, my bandmates and well kept are really, they used to be so into Volpec. Um, nice. and it, it was a similar thing of like, this is just, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just not how I approach music. It's not how I approach listening to music. And there's something about that when it's just like eating a food that you have no context for. It's like, this isn't how I cook. This isn't how I approach food tasting. So I do not know what to do with this. Um, but that kind of stuff has grown on me as I've come to just be like, it's okay. Like things that aren't how you like them are totally fine. Um, but it definitely, I think, takes some time and a little bit of space from it to like really, I don't know, to get mm -hmm. into it. To your point, though, about uh, Vampire Weekend maybe going a little jammy, they actually played with Goose. They joined Goose on stage for two songs. So... Yeah, to your point, maybe they are kind of leaning a little bit that way. <laughs> yeah, I think it's and yeah, it's just I, I, I think the, my one, it's just I'm always hesitant when people that are really good songwriters are like classical songwriters are like, we got to get really into jamming. I'm like, do you like, <laughs> do you really? Um, it's like a I, firefighter wanting to be a police officer too. like just stick to being a firefighter. Yeah, it's like you're good at one thing, and, but also like I'm not, I'm not in any place to judge. I mean, I, I, I would totally, I totally understand wanting to do things that shake things up and make it less boring. If it's if the touring a hundred days a year playing the same music is boring, I get it. I mean, I haven't really been in that exact position, but I understand. I can, I, I can empathize. You know. So let's talk about some bands that you've opened up for. Um, the Pink Stones. What that that experience was last year? Or yeah, was that in March? Had, it was in March, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that experience like? What did that what did they teach you? What did you learn from that experience? I'm I'm really about to eat my words right now because honestly, they they are a band that has really tightly constructed jams. And it was kind of inspired. It was like, honestly, it was inspiring where it's like, oh, this is like really well calibrated with really specific like on ramps and exit ramps. And that's like, you know, a very, um, a very cool thing to see a band that like has a lot of precision in the, the parts that, a lesser band it feels it feels not precise you know um they also my my brother recorded drums on their whole most recent record and so he was on the tour with us playing with them as well as with me 
Um, and I'm like a, I'm, a, I'm very much like a planner. I'm like a, a I'm sort of a detail oriented person. And um, Hunter, the lead singer of the Pink Stones, used to, he's a good friend of mine. He used to, we used to work together. Um, and he was messing with me. He was like, he's like, you write down your set list. I was like, do you not? He was like, no. He's like, memorize it. But also, why are you doing it the same way every night? I was like, and it was a little bit of like a fun challenge of like, okay, all right, we'll try it. And so we were a little looser in our set list on that tour. And it was kind of fun. It was fun. It was like, okay, this is a little different, you know? Um, but maybe won't stay with that approach, but you know, doesn't hurt to try. Yeah. Never to try. Yeah. So talk about then opening up for Noah Gunderson. That was, I mean, we, it happened, it was only one show and it was, it was truly the, one of the weirdest positive, weird in a good way. Um, things that had ever happened where I, I basically, I won't really get into the details, but I had a, I had a bad day at work. I had a day at work where I had, I decided I was going to quit. I was like, this is not going well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got home and was just in a state of very emotional and very upset. And I got a call from my manager, Drew. And he was like, hey, what are you doing three days from now? It's like, nothing. Why? And he was like, there's this guy named Noah Gunderson. Do you want to open for him at Terminal West? And I was like, what? Like, yes, I, of course I do. And he was kind of yes. like, I don't know who this guy is. I was like, tell him yes, immediately. He's great. Um, and uh, he's just such a, I mean, like crowd control, man, like live show, having the audience in the palm of your hand, just unreal. Um, he's so, yeah, he's so impressively like controlling the room in a songwriter environment where he's just playing by himself and just absolutely has, or I think he had, it was like he had a keys player just had everybody in the palm of his hand in this big venue in Atlanta, you know, dead silent. It was, it was amazing. How, how much does Terminal West, what is the capacity there? Like 700. Wow. I mean, it's yeah. like a flat, it's like a flat square room. So it just feels like you're in a warehouse basically. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. And then last you open for Susto. Mm -hmm. Um, he is kind of electronic a little bit, right? Like a little bit. He's more, you know, he's, he's kind of like an alt country kind of band. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're great. We, we have some friends in common that are in that band and have played with them in and out. And yeah, it was a similar thing of like, he, pl I, he plays with a full band and it's great. It's like, it's very psychedelic and cool, like just you know, Americana rock kind of stuff. But then when he played, he, I also opened for him when he played solo and another example of just like, he was a little different because Noah Gunderson is very like storytelling, quiet, solemn, you know, reflective. And Susto is like, it was like, it was like being at the bar and the guy doing the live music at, solo at the bar sitting in on a stool also just happens to be like absolutely amazing where it was, it had that environment of like, you know, he's like kind of talking to people during like between songs and sort of like people are interactive and he's like, yeah. And he's like, someone's like, tell this story. And he's like, okay. You know? And it was this very kind of jovial, like, I'm, you know, I'm telling the stories, I'm cracking jokes, I'm, you know, playing songs everybody loves, um, which is also just like an, another totally great approach and probably a little closer to how I would approach playing solo of just like having the, you know, making people laugh and having that kind of environment going on. Yeah.
So you mentioned a little bit about set list. How how important is a set list to you and how you construct it? Like, and how important is that to the show overall? Um, definitely really important. Um, we try to be pretty, I don't know. There's a little part of me that I used to get really, I was really obsessive about it. Um, and I always wanted to have like an arc and a, you know, and when we play longer sets, when we headline shows, it's, it's definitely got like an arc to it still sometimes. But nowadays it's, I'm a little bit more like, like having a song, like it, it, you know, having a song that is streaming really well, that people show up and that might be the only one they know is a different, uh, it's never really happened that way. So it's like, well, we got to play that one towards the end. <laughs> it's just like, is that a song that normally I would end a set with or have it be second to last? Nope, probably not. But it's it's a little bit like the set list thing is a little bit of like the, the dance of like, what do I want? What do the people coming to see me want? Um, and I definitely don't believe in like bending your will to people outside of you all the time but i feel like something like a set list where it's like that's 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 an example of a good time to sort of just respond to what people want <laughs> my uh my my dad is a very he's a very astute mind and he'll always be like if you don't start and end with something really memorable and a little faster than what you normally play then like you're you're screwed. And he told me that, and I was like, oh, hush up. You know, at first I was kind of like, what do I need that? But then I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Like I'm, you know, <laughs> it's a little. It is just good in some cases. To just give the people what they want at the start, hook them, and then give them something to kind of be excited about when they leave. But um, yeah, I I think that's also. Um kind of lost now in albums because because of streaming and because of how that's all set up you know yeah. it's more single driven now like it used to be like the last song on an album like usually was one of the best songs on the album because you wanted to leave the audience with like you know like that lasting memory yeah. talk about that and how you when you put together your album track list wise do you kind of think about it from a spotify angle or from the album itself Definitely more from the album uh, perspective. I mean, I used to, I really only ever thought like that. I used to press records though. That was a job I had for a while. And nice. like having to deal with the nitty gritty of like album construction and see that up close and personal with thousands of artists, like day in and day out, I was just like, yeah, this is really something you got to take seriously because like this is really important and a bad flow of a record can really kill it. Um, and I remember like our mastering engineer told me on this most recent record, he was like, hey, um, I just want you to be aware like this song is going to be the start of the B-side for the vinyl. And I was like, yeah, I know. And he was like, and I was like, I timed it all out. Like I already... I know how much goes on each side. Like I know what fits and I knew like that would be the cut, you know? And so that's definitely something I'm always thinking about is like, um, that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's definitely, it's hard. It's a hard balance to find of like what, what's going to work the best. I don't know. It's yeah, strange. No, I think, I think you're right. I, it is. It really has caused, sort of a, a chasm amongst artists because you know it, the other thing is like if you put out a 12 track album it's like okay well am i only putting out one single am i putting out three singles am i putting out six singles you know like it is it's a real like song and dance i guess if you want to for lack of a better word so let's talk about you talk about streaming and we've talked about streaming you have a song that has done very, very well, Mister. Five hundred and sixty-five thousand streams for the song "Syrup." 
When I say that to you, what does that like? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? I mean, I think it's mostly amusing. <laughs> it's like it, there. It's not. I, when I say funny, like I always, I always feel bad because I feel like sometimes I have been told that my sense of humor makes people think that I don't take anything seriously, um, or that I think that I'm making fun of something when I'm not. I don't mean to be like mocking uh, that song or myself. It's not self-deprecating. It's just like if you had told me to guess which song on the record was going to pop, which of the non-singles on the album was going to pop off and do well, um, that would not have been my guess. Um, and I'm really thankful it did because I like it. And I like playing it and I like that it did well enough that I have to keep playing it because it's totally a song that I think if, if it hadn't landed super well, probably would have gotten phased out sort of quickly in the set list. Um, and now the fact that it's like kind of the star of the show and we can put it later in the set list and really lean into it um is great i think the fact that it is as short as it is is what makes it so funny i mean it's literally a minute and 20 seconds long um and that is just funny to me it's just plain old funny that that's the biggest song um but i don't know yeah i mean i'm just thankful that people like it and i'm thankful that that people responded to it i mean it's it was such a off the cuff song in its writing it was recorded very off the i mean it was recorded in probably 20 minutes it was it, it took no time and was just so not overthought it was like that sounds good let's keep moving we ha we have other songs that are longer to do um and yeah i don't know i'm just i'm glad that that people dig it it's it's funny the power of music, right? I mean, we're talking about jam bands earlier. We're talking about thirty minute songs, and you have a minute and twenty second song, and it's doing just as well. Like it, it is. It's really <laughs> testament yeah. to uh, the power of music, my friend. Yeah. So we have a July tour coming up with mm -hmm. a band called Tennis Courts. I'm not familiar with them. Tell to the audience or tell the audience about what they're about. They are a really cool indie rock band uh originally from charleston now they are in new york um they have two lead singers which is very cool um my girlfriend's father always says that a band gets better the more lead singers it has and i think i agree with that um they are very good um we are touring let me look at the dates yeah we're doing a handful of dates in the southeast they've got more shows uh outside of what they're doing with me but um they're just like one of those bands that i'm so thankful exists where they they just write good songs and they work really hard and they just they get out there and they make it happen and um I don't know. There's like, they're a very, they, they, they feel very like from a different time in a good way um, where it's just very much like it's summer times here. Load everybody in the van. We're gone for two months. You know, yeah. let's get out of here. Um, we're playing shows. And so, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a good tour. So yeah. it should be it's, fun. it's a good mantra to have as a band, right? Yeah. Just, just leave for two months and, Let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about with you is probably the, the most proud moment that you've had as a songwriter is you won in 2022 the Vic Chestnut Songwriter of the Year mm -hmm. in Athens for the song Molly Haskell. Mm -hmm. First of all, the song is fantastic. Um, well done. I want to hear the story behind it and like how you got involved with this songwriter competition yeah i mean um the song itself was i was uh for a long time i was in a, a long distance relationship and um just like really wrote it about that and and kind of joking about um 
the fact that it, we were in different time zones and I would stay up, I would keep weird hours talking to her. And, um, I would, I had a lot of early classes and I would, fall, you know, literally I would like fall asleep during my film classes. And Molly Haskell is a, is a film critic. Um, that's like who that name is. Uh, and she's like somebody that I had to read a lot of her essays and she's very brilliant, but she's kind of dry. Um, and so the, you know, the joke is basically just kind of being like, I can't even stay awake in my class. And it's cause I've been staying up all night talking to you. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. Just, just a, just a very much like, a, I, um, I think that sometimes so many of my songs boil down to like, it's worth it to try something to try a relationship or to try like an experience or whatever, you know? Um, and I think a lot of the music I was writing in that time period um, was from a relationship that didn't work out in the end, but it was kind of looking back on it and being like, but it was worth it because I have a friend named Andrew uh, Blooms that makes, he's now a painter, but he, he used to make really great music. And like, he had this song that was, the chorus was like, love is never a waste. And I remember just always being really moved by that concept of just like, and it being kind of a helpful mantra of like, it's never a waste of time to, you know, try and, and be there for someone. Um, so that's kind of what the song is about. Yeah. And then the award, you know, Vic Chestnut was this important and like really storied songwriter from Athens that kind of a classic, like didn't really have the career that he maybe should have just given his skill level, but was sort of like, you know, a friend to everyone and, and was, and was really loved by everybody in that community. Um, and his first two record, two or three records were all like produced by Michael Stipe, you know, like, you know, Stipe playing all the keys parts and Vic Chestnut playing his acoustic guitar and doing his singing. And so they've, they've been doing that for a while of just, you know, trying to give, trying to give an award, I think for, for great songwriting. And I was really, you know, just thankful that they, I applied and that, you know, they were like, it was a very smooth process and they were all very nice and it was a very, very much an honor to win. So will you enter a song for this year's competition or once you win, are you not able to enter anymore? You know, well, I won't, I probably won't anymore just because I don't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. And I would kind of feel that would feel like bad form. Um, Cause you know, just, it's not totally honest anymore. Um, but yeah, no, I, I apparently, I think someone, you can apply for someone else. And I think someone applied on my behalf this year. And I got an email that was like, we're not, uh, previous winners are not eligible this year. And I was like, I didn't apply. I'm sorry. <laughs> it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, cause I don't, I mean, I'm not like super, it, it was certainly not this thing of like, now I have the competitive spirit and I have to go. <laughs> you yeah. Know? You're not searching for notor notoriety. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. I mean, it feels like a, it's also very much a, a moment in time portrait. I think usually the winner is, is sort of indicative of what's going on mm -hmm. in town at the moment. Um, so, which is, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what do your fans and your audience have to expect music wise for the next from now until the rest of the year, any more touring that you can announce in addition to the July shows or what do we got going on for the rest of the year? Don't have anything to announce tour wise besides July. We're working on some stuff for the fall, getting to some cities. Hopefully we've never been to before a little further North ideally. Um, and like Pennsylvania or not that we, far North? Well, we, we we went to Philly in New York last January and we hopefully will come back this year. The the currently we're trying to get up to kind of like the Midwest. Um mm -hmm. but our our time in our time in the Northeast was a little bit of a 
we kind of get our we kind of got our butt kicked back in January in a funny way. But um, we uh, so hopefully we're getting up to both of those areas to re reconquer that land. Um, so we um, hopefully doing a lot of that in the fall, but nothing nothing yet to announce. Um, just going back into the studio at the end of the summer, um, mm-hmm. which will be which will be really good. We got a whole whole new record to start working on. That's I think hopefully I always want to whatever I did before I want to blow it out of the water. Not in like a I think I'm not being self denigrating. It's just like I, that's always the goal. Is like mm-hmm. and I really I have a good feeling about all these new songs and we've been working on them some of them as a band which is really different than how we normally work um so those are feeling really good we've got others that'll be a lot more heady studio constructed songs that'll be i think really a lot of fun so yeah just a lot of songs in the future hopefully and you'll work then with the same producer and same studio or oh yeah tom tom who's my bandmate is he's he's the guy on all of it does all of it um help you know him and my brother and i and drew beskin our manager who's also in our band um we'll be we'll be doing a lot of shredding <laughs> the four so, of us yeah that talk about drew because that was kind of our connector to to mm-hmm. me to you um yeah you know talk about his relationship with you how you know he's really kind of gotten you to this next level yeah for sure no he's he's a i mean he's just a great I mean, he's just a great friend to have. He's he's super encouraging. He's super like keeps you on your toes, um, keeps you moving. For he's definitely like he forces me to have my eyes up, you know, and and aware of what's going on. Um, but also, he's just he's a great songwriter, and he's a really like he's a really he's got a very active mind. Like he is a thousand miles an hour all the time um and he writing with him is is always fun because he's such a an ideas guy and i will kind of edit like i'll give him something like the title i mean hometown vampire the title track of the record is a good indicator of this i wrote verses i the two verses i had written that was all i had and i was like well there needs to be a break but i don't know what it would be um needs to be a chorus he wrote what you hear now as the chorus but it was longer and it was a lot stranger and i was kind of like i don't know if this is exactly the mood of this song so i'm going to take the part that we need i'm going to cut it off and then we're going to have like a surf rock like ooh, ooh, ooh type chorus yeah. and he was like oh okay so he took what i cut off this piece of a song and he created a whole new song that was just that. And it was the craziest thing. And then we record, it's his song and we recorded it. And it it, it was funny. It came out a long time before hometown vampire did. And so it was weird hearing the song. That's like the sequel or not the sequel, but it's sort of like a, a like situation, a sibling of this song come out first and it was just it was a great it was a very cool experience um and riding with him is usually like that where he has like i have an idea he has a thousand ideas and i can i have the kind of the luxury of like let's do that let's do that let's do that and kind of you know um i definitely am i think often more of an editor and a curator than i am strictly like a million ideas kind of guy do you think that's just more of a personality thing like with him that that just kind of comes along with it or yeah he's that's just how he works with everything he's always got crazy suggestions and crazy ideas that are cool i mean i make it sound like it's bad he's just got a lot of he got a lot of big ideas i mean no other way to put it good guy to have on your side right absolutely yeah well elijah thank you so much for doing this interview Absolutely. Um, i appreciate it man i hope uh, it was as painless as it was for me and uh best of luck to you um yeah and enjoy that tour with tennis courts in july my friend yeah awesome 
Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to like, follow, subscribe to our YouTube channel, our social media pages. That helps us. That helps the bands that we feature. And also, don't forget to check out our sponsor, RAR Outfitters, R-A-W-R, Outfitters.com. Don't just wear RAR. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Dog. You've been great. This is the Music Lab podcast. <laughs>